Hey, everybody. Welcome. All right. So today we're talking about that age old question. How do you strengthen your voice? What does that mean? Um, and I can already see there's some some comments that we've been starting to talk about, like um, just this process of like, can you improve your voice and what does that mean? And so I'd like to frame things a little bit first, because I think that's really important. There's a lot of different um, things sort of packed up into that sort of concept of what we mean by a good singer, first of all. And second of all, uh, what it means to maintain your voice, especially if you have a lot of demand. Uh, so I like to frame it like this. We are physical athletes, right? This is a sport that we're learning. Uh, and even though the muscles are small, there's still muscles that we're using. And if you look at any sport, right, there's lots of ways that we can train. And usually the people who are famous are people who are actually uh, training with people, especially to maintain their careers for as long as possible without injuring themselves. So there's lots of reasons why we, uh, we as voice teachers are very helpful. And so I just like to put that out there to understand this, right? Like every sport requires some training and also some strengthening and conditioning. And so today's about sort of how we condition our voice so that it can do all the amazing things that we want when we're singing and it doesn't start to um, get lots of strain and tension um, or just get really rigid and not receptive to what we need from our music. Hi, welcome. Um, so that's really what this is about. And the first and most important concept, it comes from this. Um, it's a sport. So we need to have routines and ways to condition and train our voice. If you just run into any athletic sort of situation and you, uh, you don't have a routine to actually improve your stamina, uh, your endurance, you know, think about like learning drills in soccer or uh, running so that you have that strength in your body. Uh, this is just how our body works, right? With lots of routine uh, and the right kind of routine that follows our physiology. Um, so using a little bit of uh, science to understand our coordination and the mechanisms involved in whatever sport that may be. Uh, if we don't, uh, so if we do that, then that actually our body starts to adapt and we get better coordination. Um, there's actually all sorts of cool science about the, the way their vocal folds change and um, these uh, fibers stretch through our vocal folds to make them more elastic as we continue to work them in the right way. So this is sort of this idea. There's also all sorts of other things involved in what it means to be a good singer, of course. So this is one sort of narrow angle where we're talking about working on our strength and endurance. Uh, there's also pitch matching and creative expression and performance and all of these things that turn into what makes someone a good singer. And uh, you know, there's there are some subjective forces to that, of course. And then there's also just objective forces of, can my voice even do what I'm trying to get it to do? And so that's where we come in with this concept of strengthening our voice. Um, so I always just like to say, you know, if, if you're new to all of this, a lot of the art form is to make this look effortless, um, to make it look graceful. And uh, so we kind of hide this art form, right? It, it makes it seem like that's sort of the magic and romanticism of showbiz is that we just all of a sudden burst into song and it's just like comes so naturally to us. But you'll, you know, if you look up a lot of famous artists, um, they'll tell you that it takes a lot of work. Uh, consistency, commitment, and trial and error, and the guidance of good mentors to get to any sort of elevated place. Yes, there are outliers in this, but usually someone is learning uh, through some means of imitation, uh, following other great singers, and listening and imitating their sound, and of course singing regularly, right, daily, in the right sort of amount and knowing when to stop when your voice is feeling tired. And we're gonna talk about sort of finding this balance and flow in our routine. Um, there's actually a lot of cool science coming out about when our voice is in more of a recovery mode and the tissues are in a slightly different state. We kind of hear it as that sort of rasp, slightly raspy sound. Um, and in those situations where we need to rest our voice, just like when you think about an athlete, uh, there's moments when you want to strengthen yourself and then there's moments where you need to stretch and decompress and allow your muscles to recover. And so if you don't have the right kind of cycle, sometimes you can overwork things and then that leads to injury and it slows down your 
career and your options because you're, you know, you're injuring things because you're overworking them, uh, right? And then there's also underworking it and not having something consistent. So every time you go to sing, you're not really sure about what it should feel like. And so in those situations, we can use the wrong muscles and uh, create a lot of strain or extra exertion. And then sometimes just not even get those muscles to work in the right way. And then our voice is just going in random places. So there's lots to this. Um, and every time we're just trying to give one sort of category to focus on so that we can uh, break it up into pieces. And that's part of being a teacher is taking something really complicated and trying to separate it into a framework that we can understand and giving people stepping stones and guiding them in the process of, of finding your voice and feeling how to wield it and how to increase its power, right? So uh, it's not quite what you would think. There's a little bit of um, sort of a balance of forces. And that's generally my big philosophy with the voice is finding the right balance of forces for whatever you're doing. And that creates this sort of floating effortless feeling, uh, but it takes some work to get there and some muscle isolation. So that's sort of the process, always trying to set uh, our intentions and the framework uh, in which this sort of works. Also, you know, everyone has slightly different ranges. So a lot of the times, if you, if you really want to get the most out of this, you're going to want someone one-on-one -on -one to kind of guide you through what you specifically need with your voice. Because again, it's about bringing the voice into balance. So Sometimes we see online like all sorts of, this is how, you know, this is how you do your voice and this is going to really help you. And like, this is how I found my voice and people need different things depending on what's going on. And some of that is asking questions. How does this feel? Um, ultimately, when we do things right, we should feel balanced and it shouldn't be uh, painful. So that's one guy that you want to, you want to make sure, you know, all great singers talk about how it's not a painful experience when you do it correctly. You feel like you're just sort of floating. Uh, and when we're not doing it quite right, we feel like we're fighting ourselves and we have all these conflicting sort of uh, muscles that are working and sometimes working against our voice and closing it up as we're trying to get more sound, right? We, these concepts of pushing is something that a lot of teachers will talk about. When we're pushing or pressing, we're overexerting and that actually leads to the voice sometimes collapsing and getting too much pressure and um, friction. And that's where a lot of damage sort of comes into play. So finding strength is a little more about balance actually. Um, and we'll break it down into some pieces. And this is gonna be, you know, for, for some of you who follow me uh, normally, there's gonna be some repetition here because this is the, the process of getting our voice to grow. So it's um, a lot of it is our, our basic vocal technique. Uh, but again, with this sort of guide of being more um, athletically focused, like how do we get more volume, more uh, resonance, and a, a stronger, more stable sense to our voice? Uh, and we'll go over each of those kinds of features. So the first one is this concept of vocal support, right? So usually um, I go through a checklist of working with the body, make sure you stretch, you get loose, and that you're doing regular exercise because that's going to help your your body just be more receptive to working with these sort of fine coordination skills. Uh, and it also helps with your breath so that you can get a deeper, more full breath. You know, if we're not doing a lot of exercise, our um, cardiovascular system gets weaker. And so actually by just doing exercise on the regular uh, and in a way that's not causing a lot of excess muscle tension, like a lot of weightlifting and that kind of stuff can sometimes counteract the voice, uh, but that's actually gonna help you uh, so that you can start to breathe in the right way, right? And then we talk about with vocal support, um, it's actually breathing low into our ab abdominal muscles, our belly and our back, and allowing this to expand, uh, breathing from and singing from this area and controlling our breath pressure from this area is much better than if we're trying to do it by squeezing muscles in our neck or trying to squeeze any muscles in our shoulder or our chest. So some of this has to do with... Um, Yes, yes, this is all about the balance of forces between our subglottal pressure and our resonance. And those two forces together allow our vocal folds to flap in a healthy and open and full way when we get lots of resonance uh, and we have freedom here, which has a lot to do with our lower abdominal breathing. Uh, and we you know, get vibrato and some of these other things, we can get our voice to grow and be 
uh, louder than an entire orchestra, which is a really cool uh, effect. And I'll tell you, it's uh, it has a lot more to do actually with the resonance because the way our body is naturally shaped, uh, we get this certain kind of resonance that can be heard over a lot of other musical instruments. Uh, and so that's the really cool thing about like opera, for example, is that you can you can hear a voice and understand it while there's a full orchestra playing at the same time. Um, and that's why that technique is very particular. Uh, and a lot of my training uh, initially is in the classical realm and I do a lot of contemporary stuff as well. But uh, if you think about classical music, it was unamplified uh, in a large auditorium and for many, many hours at a time. You know, some of these operas can be really, really long. Um, and so the technique is designed to create endurance and stability. Uh, of course, stylistic things and all these other things in the contemporary realm can be complex and there's definitely techniques to maintain those as well. But I highly recommend for anyone that you should get some of this core practice um, that comes from the classical tradition. People have been singing for thousands of years and teaching people how to do it in a way that doesn't destroy their voice. Um, again, our vocal folds themselves are very small. You know, For most men, it's about the size of a quarter. For women, maybe even the size of a dime. It's a small piece of tissue. And actually, a lot of the energy isn't directed towards that small tissue. It's a, about using your entire body as you're singing. So that leads us again to our breath work. Um, the first thing we want to feel is resistance of air. So we breathe low into our belly and our back. We feel that expand down and out. And then we want to do things that help us feel this buildup of pressure. Now, our natural exhale, we it caves in. If we keep squeezing in this direction, it's going to be destabilizing on our vocal folds because it's sort of sending a column of air out that's not quite even. Uh, and it also, we start to squeeze our muscles. Instead, what we do um, for a lot of vocalists is we push out against our exhale, against these abdominal muscles. And this creates this uh, resistance of air and pressure that we can, uh, that we can sing on. It's not the only thing involved, but this, uh, is often a one-to-one -one relationship with going higher and lower. And then that plus resonance creates some interesting sort of um, variability, but it's a huge aspect of the voice. A lot of people would consider it the engine or the fuel of our voice is our breath and the pressure that we create with our lower abdominal muscles. So you can do a hissing style exercise to practice this. Um, this is like forming a small space here, like a TS with your lips, your tongue and your teeth. Now we wanna be careful that we're not trying to force things out from these muscles. I'm not, <laughs> or any sort of blowing. It's actually all from these lower abdominal muscles. And I'm going. I'm trying to wake up these muscles and get them a little more active so I can feel that right kind of coordination. So this type of conditioning, it might seem really simple, but if you do this a little bit every day, you're gonna get those muscles to start to coordinate in the right way. It should push down and out into the belly and back. Um, so that's going like this. I'll do that a couple times. Before I even start doing any singing, um, and you'll notice if you get into a flow with this, your breath is going to start to get deeper. Uh, and then you're going to um, feel this really nice sort of rebound effect with your breath and it'll grow. And hopefully you'll start to feel a little more traction here. Um, you can also blow against your hand if you really are having trouble feeling this. Go in like. Or even um, if I'm rewinding, just the feeling of a cough. Like if you go like. <coughs> you should feel those muscles kick out. It's sort of designed into how our body works to create pressure um, for a lot of different reasons, clearing our throat, uh, going to the bathroom. All of these things are naturally hardwired into us um, as well as speaking and singing. So these muscles are, we're using them all the time, actually. It's just, we because we use them all the time, it's hard to, to feel them actually because we're very used to it. Uh, and we're usually doing it in a much more relaxed or sort of weaker way when we're talking compared to singing, when we have to sustain things for longer and use a much wider vocal range than we normally do when we're talking. So we're getting these muscles active and sort of warmed up so we can feel all of this. Um, that's the first step. And the next step is to use SOVTs, which is this fancy term for when our mouth is 
uh, more closed, kind of like the, again, like that TS sound, but now we're going to do more sung SOVTs. Um, you're actually able to feel that buildup of pressure. When our mouth is closed with a consonant, um, we're actually able to control the pressure better than when our mouth is open and all the air can rush out. So we're controlling things from the front of our mouth right here. Um, and then when the vocal folds come together, that's also helping us control the pressure. So we have these two things working together. They can easily sort of get crisscrossed. You know, if we're not using our abdominal muscles, these muscles get a little too engaged and they try to compensate. And often what happens is the muscles around our larynx try to squeeze things together um, or we create a lot of tension trying to collapse the space here to make a smaller instrument that's easier to support breath pressure wise. Uh, but obviously that leads to uh, vocal fatigue and injury and will often make our voice sound smaller. So sometimes when we're trying really hard as we're singing, we're actually um, closing off our instrument and reducing its resonant capacity. Hi, welcome. So a lot of vocal support is actually trying to help us find mobility and freedom here. So these two forces are not codependent. Um, every time I want to uh, go up higher or put more power into my voice, everything starts to squeeze or collapse. And that's that co common sort of look of the head and the neck coming up. Uh, and often sometimes shoulders coming up, the larynx will often come up and everything starts to kind of contract inward. Um, so in general, we're trying to create a little more space and release here and our breath pressure really helps with that. So you can feel this out when you do like a Z or an M or an N or an NG. Uh, and so I'll show you what I mean, like a basic vocal siren going like, now this is already putting us in a dilemma you might notice as you're doing this if you're not used to it that these muscles start to want to contract as you go up higher right you might go and things get really tight we're trying to work against that and transfer all that energy to our lower abdominal muscles so just like that ts sort of pulsing sensation while i'm doing this i'm going and just trying to keep this in a draped, relaxed shape. So the cool thing is our consonants can help us feel out vocal strength as long as we're not trying to squeeze or sort of spit them out with our mouth by over enunciating. It really just has to be in the position and then relax to the vowel in the position and relax the vowel and the energy is really coming from our gut from our lower abdominal muscles if you do any martial arts it's very similar right where does the punch come from it comes from your your core actually and that's where you're going to get the most force and strength in a way that doesn't fatigue the smaller muscles so very similar principles um true for a lot of sports actually so it's how we wield our energy in a way that doesn't fatigue our voice um you can do a, an m you could go like and again, I'm just trying to keep this pretty loose and relaxed and have this sort of internal space here. Um, and that's sort of the exercise and the practice. And you might be creating a lot of tension as you're doing this. It's just one strategy. And having a teacher can help you see if you're maybe putting unnecessary force uh, into the consonant with these facial muscles. So you can do an N as well. You can go like. And all of these SOVTs, again, are designed to help us really feel our lower abdominal belly and to start to exercise those muscles. So I'm doing this a few times to show it. But if you do this regularly, you're actually going to exercise those muscles. Um, yeah, very, very good. I love hearing that, you know, and keep keep putting that out there because, you know, as you can see, um, a lot of people are, do not feel that that's the case, that you can train your voice. And um, it's something that I'm trying to work against, right? Because most vocalists know that you need to train and condition your voice to maintain it, to have better flexibility and control. Uh, and it feels a lot better and you get a better sense of well-being when you uh, know and can, uh, can tell that your voice can do the things that you want it to do without just sort of reaching and straining. Um, so I always, I, you know, just like what I sort of mentioned earlier in the comments, uh, it's almost a more bold claim to me to say that you can't train a physical skill, that it is untrainable. That's, I, I would kind of love to like get some insight as to like what scientific reasoning 
comes from that concept that things are actually untrainable and that you can't uh, develop your body in, in certain ways. Uh, so that'd be my question sort of back at someone. There's lots of science on how you can develop your voice. You know, just look it up and look up famous artists and ask them about it uh, or see if they've, you know, people have asked them about this question. So the next thing, and this goes, follows sort of in the line of, um, of breath support is to do more staccato style exercises and really from the belly. So it feels like a belly giggle. So I might do like, um, Ha, 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 ha. And I'm not ha, 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 trying to squeeze from here. Um, uh, instead, it's ha, 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 ha. Oh, we're going to talk about changing the volume of your voice. That's actually a really interesting concept um, that has a little more to do with resonance, uh, but also breath pressure and sort of these toggles that we use. Um, so as something becomes more resonant, it tends to carry more. Uh, as we add vibrato, our voice gets wider, and sometimes that also has us have the feeling of, of more volume. But generally, volume is a little more of an illusion, actually. Uh, the decibel level really increases from uh, amplifying the resonance and sort of this cool feedback loop that happens when we have appropriate breath pressure and the right resonant space with our, um, our vowel shapes and our vocal tract is nice and relaxed. Uh, and it starts to kind of amplify. So think about how sound waves work and like feedback um, on a, 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 if you've ever heard feedback on a monitor or a speaker, uh, it's sort of something that can start to happen as a physical force. And we can learn to utilize that as singers and um, get, get a really big volume. Uh, but it's a little more indirect than you'd think of just direct decibel force pressure, just like what I was talking about. That tends to actually fatigue our instrument uh, and actually makes our sound get smaller a lot of the times because we're over muscling it rather than finding just the right sweet spot. So another analogy or sort of example that I like to use is when people are fixing up an organ, like a pipe organ, right? Think about similar to a voice. Um, sometimes rust gets, gets in there, you know, over time and the organ loses its shape and it gets a little smaller or a little wider and the different things like that. And just create shaving away a little bit of space and helping get to the right design shape for that pitch, uh, all of a sudden it's like four times louder. So that's sort of an organ restoration thing that people will do. As a vocalist, we have to feel this out with our um, internal perception and muscle memory. And that takes a little bit of time and is uh, really about the consistency. So again, I'm doing these um, staccato style exercises to really get that belly engaged and to feel that uh, change. So I was doing stepwise first, going like, uh, uh, Ha, 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 ha. You can see I'm just trying to be like a ventriloquist here, just loose and open. And all of it is ha, 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 ha. And that's going to help train it. Um, you can also just practice jumping from one to five or slightly bigger intervals if you're feeling game for it. Um, ha, 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 ha. What you're going to start to notice is that higher note needs to be a little more active with our belly. And I might move this around, right? Different places, you're going to really feel this as you go higher in your range. Like, so I'm feeling for that resistance um, and that sort of floating sensation with my abdominal muscles rather than trying to squeeze in, pushing out against my exhale. And this creates this muscular antagonism uh, and that's the pressure, sort of the, um, if you think of like a bagpipe, right? It's sort of, we're creating that inflated bag where we can create, uh, so we can start to create pitches on top of it. Higher pitches require a little more of that down and out sink. So that's why we want to breathe low into our belly and our back. Um, so there's that kind of stuff, right? We've got breath work, SOVT work. That could be also as simple as just going like, ma. Ma, ma, making sure that you're really pitching the consonant, like, mm, like a hum. Ma, ma. A lot of times what happens, and notice this if this is happening with you, we're not pitching our, um, our consonant, and it goes like, ma, 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 right? And sometimes often it's not going to get up to the higher pitch. Mama, right? That's sort of what happens. But 
the, the consonants help us actually find the right pressure. So it's a great way to calibrate pressure and force. Too much force and mm, you're pressing and you're going to feel these muscles start to engage. Mm, ma, ma. So I'm calibrating that. It's a sort of a fine toggle control that we can do with our body as we start to practice this more and more and go throughout our range regularly to feel that change of force. Um, so that's that consistent practice. Um, and then the other one was doing the staccato thing. So that's on the support side of stuff. Now let's talk about resonance. Um, resonance is, is a complex thing. It's uh, a lot of people don't quite understand what I mean when I'm talking about it. So I always like to describe what resonance is. It's that tinny ringing sort of cricket like sound you'll hear in a voice. Um, it's essentially like our resonator and any resonator has to have an opening and an open space. And those two things together create uh, amplification or acoustical back pressure. And that uh, allows uh, essentially things to vibrate together in a um, synchronous way. And when things have synchronized motion and they're vibrating together, they start to amplify each other's shaking. Uh, and so, you know, this is on a fine detail thing when we're thinking about sound waves, but that's essentially the physical force that we're dealing with. Um, and so we have to calibrate this and find these sweet spots. I like to use humming when our mouth is closed, we actually um, have an easier time, just like thinking about the SOVT concept, we have an easier time controlling our pressure and we can also get that sort of bounce back of resonance in an easier way. It's much harder when our mouth is wide open. And so actually we like to work with smaller spaces first uh, and again, not codependent with our breath pressure. We don't wanna be squeezing them as we're engaging our breath pressure, but instead we're using those smaller spaces to actually feel and perceive our resonance better. Um, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Um, that's very true with a lot of, um, of runs. It's a, it's a difficult thing actually, right? A lot of agility techniques are a lighter sort of style. Um, so it's more about making sure that you put the force into the right sort of moments. Um, a lot of times, you know, I'll do a whole thing on runs and riffs. I, you know, it's maybe coming up later this year. I'll put that one in. Um, it's that feeling of the rubber band effect. And that has a lot to do with our support. Where do we lean in to build up some pressure and then sort of riding uh, the wave to other notes? So I talk about sort of grouping them together and learning them in individual parts. And then you can add more and more energy. Uh, and in that way, you can feel that sort of like lean in effect. And then that's sort of stretching the rubber band and then um, falling back into the other pitches. It's a little harder when we go up. That might be something I, I'll add in for um, future agility exercises. But that's, it tends to be pretty, like that's a harder thing to do is to put more and more energy into it. You have to be careful that you're not putting energy into the entire phrase, but just the moments that need um, sort of that emphasis so that we can build up some pressure so that we can start to, to write on it. The other thing is finding the right resonance space. So um, it could be particular to whatever run you're doing. But a lot of times when we're working on runs, we're trying to sculpt them out so that we get just the right efficiency um, so that we can get a nice full sound without it getting too sluggish or um, uh, just uh, inaccurate, right? And so mm -hmm. we're constantly working on, okay, I need a little more space, a little more breath pressure until I can get just that right sweet spot. But a lot of the times, again, the answer has to do with resonance. So I often show this in a low part of my range, but I'd like to show it a little bit in the middle, just so you can really hear how I'm playing with the overtones. And it's sort of built into how our body works as well and how we talk, that every vowel shape, as we change this um, sort of the opening uh, in our resonator with our lips and our tongue, uh, and sometimes the jaw, although in general, this tends to be a little too unwieldy. So we try to get our jaw out of the way because if it it's working a lot, it's sort of working at the same time and it makes it sort of less accurate how we can fine tune our resonance. Um, and often we'll just collapse the instrument a little too much and just get too tight and sore back here, which is just uncomfortable. Um, but I'll show you that I'm actually starting to try and find these little sweet spots. And these are actually just vowel shapes ultimately. Um, uh, as I sort of am collapsing the space with my mouth closed. So I go like this, like. You can see it looks kind of like chewing, 
and I was just moving my resonance from the front of my face to the back, allowing my tongue to sort of um, go in a slightly sort of wave-like shape as it collapses and then opens up so I can feel that change of these different formats or sort of energy sweet spots that make up our vowels. So again, I go like... Hopefully you can hear that, but it sort of sounds like a little didgeridoo-like sound and I'm riding the harmonic series essentially, right? It sounds kind of like that classic sort of um, spiritual um, sort of sound that we, we get a lot of the times in that type of atmospheric music. Um, so again, this is my way that I'm teaching my body actually to calibrate these spots because we can't really like consciously um, target these things. We have to work them into our muscle memory. So actually this is why again, like humming might seem like a really simple exercise, but in the end of the day, it's actually my most it's one of the most helpful exercises for me because I don't have to sing very much. I'm singing all the time. I can actually get a good sense of where all of these sweet spots are and kind of just wake up the instrument and feel the vibration pass to different parts of my vocal track. Uh, and that actually stretches out the resonator. So I call this vocal stretching. It's one of the most important things you can do to get your voice up and running in a healthy way. And it's getting that flexibility. It's not just one sort of shape, right? It's this ability to sort of move between these different shapes and it's generally pretty relaxed, right? So that's why we need our breath support to be engaged as well. So I take that deep breath, feel that gentle like sort of sensation and like make sure I can move all these other muscles and allow them to sort of drop away from this area, the oscillator, which just needs to do its thing. Like if you've ever seen like a spinning top or a dreidel, um, and if you tap the dreidel, right, it flies away with a spinning top. Um, this similar with the vocal folds. We want them to just flap without any extra influence or too much extra influence, unless of course we're trying to do a little grit. That's a, a totally other topic. Uh, but in general for the healthiest singing, we want space here. So I often also um, think about this neutral larynx concept when I'm doing this sort of humming, which is as I take my breath, I let this drop, right? And I try to get a little bit more space here. If your larynx is really tight up against everything, it's a smaller instrument. Um, you don't want to push it too far down because that creates a, a rigidity. And that's also something that will block resonance. As muscles get tight, they are blocking the vibration as they're loose, we're able to kind of keep moving that vibration and it moves outside of us and starts to bounce off of things. And we start to sing a room. And that's actually the, the real power is when you can learn to sing a room and uh, feel that sort of bounce back of resonance. So this is our way to feel it internally. And then I start to do it um, open. So I'll be like, this is wa and ya, and there are two main glides, right? If you think about a resonator, it's the best way that we can change the two variables, our opening and the open space. I'm going, my heel of my tongue is coming up, making it smaller, and then relaxing. And then feeling out that sort of difference. Same thing here. And both of these forces are really good at helping us feel something um, called the singer's format, which is something you can see in any sort of overtone analyzing apps. Uh, and it, what it'll show you is that there's around like 3,000, 4,000 hertz, there's this extra bump of energy that happens because of our physiology. Uh, and wa and ya can help us get that sort of ignited. If you think about it, it's sort of like starting from a smaller space and then opening to the larger space and trying to maintain that resonance. So this is way, the way that I like to calibrate that is by going through wa and ya. I do a number of exercises that help us feel this, right? So I might do like... And I'm trying to get the first the way to drop my jaw. And I'm 
feeling my ability for my tongue to move up and down without anything else trying to move. Um, I often talk about how when we speak, it's a little more visual. So we tend to do this thing where we spread a little more, especially with E vowels, things like that. Uh, this tends to collapse the instrument, especially if we're not used to um, using our vocal support in the right way. Later on down the road, this helps us do certain belting techniques, but you want to be very careful about it. Um, and I, I think there's an important process of conditioning your voice before you're able to do that in a healthy way. Um, so in, at first, I really want muscle isolation so I can get, uh, so I can have a symbiotic relationship of all these muscles, right? There's no codependency between breath pressure and my ability to adjust the shape. I want them to feel like slightly separate forces so I can find toggle and modify things if I'm feeling tension or anything sort of locking in place. So again, simple exercise, I was using a minor pattern here, going like, way I sit on a single pitch and just be like and I'm moving through all these different sort of vowel formats what you'll realize is it's the same thing I'm doing with my mouth closed just open um, so in like nice fluid motion helps me get a smoother tone helps me start to control some of these sensations as I'm feeling oh I'm not quite getting the right resonance a lot of times what happens is people start to push harder and that actually backfires right so again that's the main principle here is we want to be able to sort of scan around in a light and flexible way until we find these sweet spots and then we remember them um, through practice and repetition so that's sort of that concept you can practice moving resonance from the front of your face to the back. Um, that's sort of eventually a very specific topic. Um, and so we can get into fine detail when we're talking about certain registers of the voice and sort of how they feel different and use slightly different resonance strategies. Um, the other concept that I wanted to talk about is chord compression um, and finding balance with our chord compression. So this is dealing with the resonator a little, uh, with the oscillator part of our resonator. And we want uh, to just be very careful that we're not overdoing this. But oftentimes, like for example, in our head voice, people have trouble getting the vocal folds together uh, and it sounds too breathy and we can't control our pressure this way. So that's why we kind of give it a specific sort of terminology. We can't really consciously control this very much, but we can use um, certain sensations to help us feel when we are engaging uh, with more chord compression or less chord compression. Um, so in uh, chest voice, a lot of the times there's too much chord compression and that's when uh, we get sort of sometimes extra strain feeling. We're trying to get that to relax, feel a little more spacious. And in head voice, it can be the opposite actually. There's um, often not enough chord compression. And it sounds like this if there isn't enough chord compression. So I'm like, right, it's sort of that like kind of uh, like deflating sort of sound. Um, and it it's that, my inability for these chords to come together. Ultimately, you can learn to control this and create breathiness in your tone, and that makes for a really nice sound. But you have to first learn how to turn it on and off uh, and get in control of it. So one uh, simple way that you can feel this is if you hold your breath for a second, you'll feel your vocal folds come together, especially when you let it go, you'll feel them release. So if I'm like, you might, and the other trick is you can take a breath on top of your breath and feel it open for a sec and let a little air in and then come right back together. So going like, right, and you can feel that they seal to actually help with that pressure system. We want to be very careful. We want most of the energy to be from our lower abdominal muscles, but we do need this to be together. And you can do exercises uh, like with a G, for example, and this helps with, with cord compression. So the simple one that I do often is like, key, 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 key. if you think of like, um, if someone were to like punch you in the belly and you, uh, 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 that's a glottal when it feels like it's sort of coming together a little more forcefully. And this is helping us get a little bit of that sticky sensation. So you might start with that feeling of slightly holding the breath for a second. You don't want to do that for too long, but it's together and then 
ki 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 and the, the science behind this is it's just helping to get those muscles a little stronger so doing a little bit of this in your warm up routine um, over time is just going to build more resiliency into your vocal folds so ki 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 uh, the other one that i've been adding in is going um, saying the word sing and then freely and the ng is feeling a little bit of that so it's like sing freely that so using an ng sound can be a great sobt i didn't mention that earlier but going like so it's counterintuitive right that by having a more sealed off space, this time my tongue's up by the soft palate, uh, actually helps us feel this equilibrium a little better. And then we try to transfer it to that open mouth feeling. Um, so sing freely. It also helps us get in the right kind of position. As we sing in head voice, we need a slightly taller, more narrow position rather than that spreading thing. Uh, and that helps us get those higher overtones to activate. Um, again, it's a feeling-based art form, so you have to shift around until you really feel that resonance. You can use apps to actually see it sometimes, although that can be a little complex. It's best to just to feel it out, sort of uh, the perception as it comes, at least for me, from the back of the head. And this is often why people call it head voice. And in chest voice, we feel a little more vibration in our chest. Um, so that's this sort of game. The other thing that really helps with chord compression um, is to use a straw. Uh, so I have this metal reusable straw. You can use hard plastic uh, or any straw really, but I recommend reusable ones for our environment's sake. Uh, you, you can buy the fancy SOVT straws. They have slightly different gauges. So slightly smaller to slightly bigger, and it helps to train uh, a little bit of this breath support thing. But also because our mouth is in this relaxed sort of draped feeling, uh, we, it actually helps with our vocal folds managing sort of the adjustments between registers and maintaining uh, a sort of a balance with our chord compression. So in every situation with support, it's a balance of how much pressure for whatever pitch we're singing. Um, with resonance, it's finding just the right sort of shape that gets uh, between, you know, sort of more closed and more open that gets us the right kind of resonance. And then even with between our registers uh, as well, and then this will, will help us feel that balance for a lot of people. Uh, it's a specific shape, so I don't think it's an end-all, save-all kind of a thing. Like you're learning to get that feeling in one shape, and ultimately you want to be able to get this feeling with every vowel shape, and that's when you get the most um, freedom in your sound and the most resonant impact. So again, I'll do stuff like this. I'll go like... Just doing sirens like that is helping to condition and teaching the muscles to stay together at the right kind of chord compression. You can do specific ones, right? You can be like, so basically any exercise that we've been doing, you can practice it with a straw uh, and then go back to like, sing free. So what's going through my head is a little bit of a balance of all of these three forces. I'm feeling, is my breath support gaining traction? Do I have some resistance that keeps it buoyant and floating? That's going to keep stability under here. Um, do I hear a little bit of that tinny ringing sound? Uh, and that's a little bit about the shape. Oh, maybe I'm doing too much spreading or I need to relax my jaw a little more. Move my head around a little bit just so I can get back in a nice relaxed open uh, placement. And then are my vocal folds coming together in a way that's not uh, uncomfortable, right? So I like, you know, that's sort of a nice order of operations that you can think about. And it's specific to every little thing that you're singing. So I always recommend working with uh, a guide or a teacher if you're unsure about these feelings and forces and they can help guide you through them so you can learn it faster uh, and in a way where you're not gonna hurt yourself. It comes from the experience of going through it yourself and working with a number of people and, um, and noticing certain things that happen when people uh, warm up or work their voice in a certain order. Uh, you know, a lot of times we wanna get right to the big brassy stuff, but if we're not getting this space and feeling that resonance, 
um, we're just going to start to hurt ourselves. So there's that. Um, a lot to cover this time around. I just wanted to give us different categories. You might find that, oh, it's my support that's not working, or I'm having trouble with resonance. Um, my cord compression is really bad. The, the next sort of objectively challenging thing to do is to work on sustains. Uh, so this is where we can, as we sing into something for longer, we can build up more resonance and more power, uh, or we can start to squeeze and collapse into it and it gets smaller and smaller. Um, so what I do with this is I practice actually inserting some SOVTs uh, so that we can feel sort of this continual spin or build up of pressure that keeps our lower support more buoyant and active. Uh, and then I take them out and I try to maintain that, um, that sensation. So it's kind of like using a bolster, so to speak. So if I'm going like, no, 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 that no, 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 no. I'm hitting three times with that N and I'm trying to pay attention to what my belly feels like. Uh, and then I might add in five. I might go like, no, 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 no. And then eventually I might go back to three and then hold out the last one for a little longer. So I'm starting to coast, right? And getting a little bit of buoyancy, like. No, 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 no. And I'll start to do that in different parts of my range. So I might first, again, the order is doing. No, 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 no. Making sure I've got the right breath pressure. I'm in a new spot, so I might be trying to help a little bit. So I'll check in and move my head around. No, 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 no. And then I'll do five. No, 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 no. And I can feel a little more engagement in my lower abdominal muscles. And then. No, 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 no. As I'm doing this, I'm trying to keep it in that ideal sort of position. So I keep that resonant ring going. Uh, and then my support can also help me maintain and sustain that. And these two forces are sort of helping me calibrate and keep it in that sort of sweet spot. So again, like, no, 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 no. Slightly higher chest voice. I'm starting to feel like I need a little more uh, back placement. And so I'm relaxing my jaw a little more um, and feeling a, a slightly higher tier of overtone. Every sort of four or five notes, you're going to feel a slightly different place where your um, your body is going to have a better uh, resonant capacity. So it's like surfing your um, your ladder of resonant waves. Um, and then again, I'll do five. Be like. No, 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 no. Trying to keep the jaw nice and loose. And then, no, 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 no. So I'm feeling my support sustaining out. Uh, and I'm, you might notice I'm starting to use more vibrato um, as we start to get our voice to grow more and more. That's a very typical thing that actually really helps us continue to amplify the sound. There's only so far we can really go with our straight tone sound. Um, as we're singing with vibrato, we're finding it's essentially a product of healthy singing. It happens as you strengthen your voice more and more. Um, and you get the right balance of support and resonance. And then all our, our muscles are starting to vibrate in a sort of synchronized way where they're contracting and relaxing. Uh, and it actually just helps us have more efficiency in our sustain. Uh, and that allows for these muscles to stay even more relaxed, which can help us amplify even more resonance. Um, and that's sort of how it's built into our system. So, you know, the classic thing where um, I've done this before and it, it almost sounds like a song, but if I go like, and I is I first, I sing into my straight tone and it 
sort of milliseconds, I'm like, okay, I'm locking into that right resonant place that I've, I've felt and explored in my technique. And then I'm feeling my support continue to sustain and engage here. And then as I find just that right sweet spot and I gently expand the space, I start to initiate vibrato and it helps to relax the space even more. Uh, and then I can get a really, really full sound. So again, like, and on. And then you make sure that you can stay relaxed around it. Um, and then you can start to get bigger and bigger sounds. Um, so that's that process of sustains. Uh, vibrato takes some practice and we have some, some exercises on how to help find your vibrato, often changing directions really rapidly, going like, um, because it happens at the ends of our phrases a lot um, at, at we, that we start to feel vibrato. So it's a, sort of a sensation of dropping into something that our body's naturally doing to protect our larynx, to protect the mechanism as we start to add a little more core compression bit by bit, a little more breath pressure, and we really find that nice ping in our resonance. We have these three forces just calibrated just right. Uh, everything starts to oscillate with it. Uh, and that's just the way that the, the body uh, finds balance. Um, and it's a lot of instruments imitate this, this sort of um, force that happens. Uh, yeah. Thank you, by the way. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah. So this is the, um, this trick with avoiding strain, it's usually finding out what force is out of balance. Um, so it can be very particular to the singer. And I would Often I want to listen to them and sort of get a sense of visual cues, like is the head and the neck coming out? Um, if, uh, do, do I feel like I'm squeezing in? These are going to be signs that, uh, you know, I have a support issue. Uh, some of it, you know, again, support and resonance are intricately connected. So it's, it might also be a feeling of, can I get the jaw relaxed? Can I get my tongue and the front to be nice and relaxed? Sometimes the tongue wants to pull back. So we all have, there's all sorts of ways that uh, different, different bodies and different voices um, and different voice types uh, sort of compensate and fall into certain kind of tension habits. Uh, so sometimes I'm just using simple biofeedback with my hands, like by putting my hand here. And uh, I want to make sure that it's not biting me, if it's rigid, that means that it's it's um, locking into place. And it, I want it to be soft and supple so that I can just kind of hang there. Um, but sometimes it's hard for us to get our jaw to relax if our head and our neck is out like this. We have to force it down. And so it can become this sort of interesting little game. And it takes um, you know practice over time, intuition from a teacher, as well as voice science, and checking in with these things. So like, you know, I did a, a live stream on like your first vocal lesson. A lot of times I'm secretly and sometimes not so secretly checking in like a sort of mechanics of like, okay, what parts do I feel like need a little extra work? Uh, and that can help me hone in and customize sort of a type of exercise routine that's going to help a person find the best strength. If you're just overworking something that already works well, it's that classic problem of like being an athlete and just like getting really strong arms, but having no shoulders or lats to support it or um, all of this kind of thing. So it'll just go away if you're not creating a well-rounded exercise routine. Or so I've been told by um, uh, physical trainers and sort of this process is actually very similar, which I love hearing from when I work with students like that. Um, so it really is about the balance. Um, and, you know, three years into the journey, that um, that's a really great place to be. And you can check in, you know, like as you're singing, can you move your head and your neck around? What are your shoulders doing? Like look in a mirror. All of these things are really going to help. Uh, but it's sort of a checklist like this. And so that's why it's hard for me to specifically answer that question unless I have more um, information, right? Uh, and so that's why, again, it's tricky online because you'll hear like, just do these these things. And it's, I yes, that's helpful. But I think it's more actually like figure out what your voice needs to stay in balance. And like it's a mind-body connection feeling-based art form, uh, and you can hear it, you can feel it, um, and sometimes you can just know by uh, voice science that certain things are going to help in general to uh, strengthen different parts of the voice. 
So there's that. And then there's also just enjoying what you're doing. And, uh, and some of it is a psychology thing, right? When we're emotionally connected to our music, uh, that helps us generate more power when we're emotional in a deep part in our body, right? And that's sort of that singing from the gut kind of sensation. Um, we can get more expressive and all sorts of magical things happen when we're um, synchronized that way. So that's also part of it. And, you know, and this brings me back to uh, the very beginning, which is this sort of concept that I come across a lot where people are like, I've never heard anyone who wasn't good at singing get better at singing. And it's just con a confusing question to, or a confusing concept to me. Um, knowing what just finds a good singer is sort of like a, not like a truth statement, but about a, a subjective thing. Like you can talk about technically that some singers are able to hit certain notes, but you could scream out a note or like squeak something. And it doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be good. Uh, sometimes just using what's available to you and your voice in a really artful way uh, can be incredibly moving to people telling a story with your lyrics. Um, there's so much that goes into what, defines a good singer to someone. So I would first have to assess what that means, but it leads me to this concept of like, do you have a fixed mentality or do you have a growth mentality? Do you feel like everything that I do um, is reflecting on how good or bad I am as a singer? Like if I start singing immediately and I'm like, oh, I, I cracked and that hurt a little bit or like I wasn't hitting the pitch. So therefore I am a bad singer and then stopping right there. Or are you someone who says like, this is a learning experience and like by feeling out what I what doesn't work, I've gone through being a horse before and all these sorts, sorts of things and cracking and having weird moments on stage where you fall out of tune and all of this stuff. And if you don't let it defeat you, but you learn from it uh, and you seek resources and guidance, that's the road to being a great singer. And a lot of times we don't get to hear the journey of that singer until they're already at a place where they're ready to present to people. And so we get this illusion sometimes that like, oh, they already just knew how to do that. And like, they're so lucky because it's their genetics or something like that. And it just, it doesn't really make sense to me. So the growth mentality is huge. Um, it really is about uh, the, that learning process and seeing that like everything you do can, can help you learn to the next step and finding a routine. So again, some of this has to do with people who are obsessed with singing and are singing like personalities are constantly people who are imitating sounds, you know, being creative and uh, often sometimes annoying with making lots of silly sounds and that conditioning over time, imitating singers on, you know, on the radio, whatever it is, that's helping us condition our voice, but not everyone does it in a way that's healthy and some people get stuck. And so being a voice teacher is, is actually making this more inclusive so that it's not like only good singers should sing, right? That doesn't make any sense. It's like only people who are flexible should stretch, right? That's, uh, it's more of a wellness activity. And there's lots of ways that we can mean meaningfully con connect with others through singing and through song. Um, and I don't think you have to be the most masterful singer to do that. In fact, sometimes that pressure of trying to sing 100% perfectly actually makes you a boring performer. So uh, it's complex, right? And that's why it's like, it deserves some conversation. Uh, and I totally understand the frustration because these changes happen slowly with this mechanism. Um, we have to be careful with it. It's small little piece of, uh, of muscle and tissue that we're working with. Uh, and it can, it can get fatigued really quickly. Um, you know, even just from our talking throughout the day and the emotional sort of energy we put through our voice when we're angry and when we're stressed and we're fearful and all of this kind of stuff can really close off our voice. So um, no worries at all. I really appreciate it. Everyone's been so cool with your comments and following along and asking questions. And that's what this is all about. Um, so hopefully I, I gave you some practical things to work through as well as um, the framework that we have to put our headspace in in order to actually grow and develop. And I can tell you, like, I've certainly had times and I know many well-established singers who go through this feeling of imposter syndrome, uh, you know, feeling like, uh, you know, like that you're maybe not good enough or like, you know, going through difficult moments with your voice and technique 
in throughout your career based on what you're trying to uh, accomplish and trying to reinvent yourself and all of these kinds of things. And it's part of the journey of being a singer. So it's not a one to one. Um, there's so many singers who we've identified as really amazing singers and then have run into technical issues and needed the guidance of a teacher to help them maintain their career and um, stay healthy with their voice so that they can keep singing. So that's really the goal. Um, I've been there, we've been through these journeys. And, uh, you know, again, as a teacher, some of it's from experience and trying to guide people through that process of finding those moments of a free, full and powerful voice. And I'll leave you with this concept, which is when you get the right balance of forces, it feels sort of like you're floating. You create this homeostasis. And it's a really, really exciting feeling, sort of like flying. It's not like I'm holding a hundred pound weight. It's actually this amazing power from the balance of resonance and um, and support and and uh, proper cord compression and, and our emotions and all of these things all together. So that's when I think it's uh, powerful and can be transformative to people when we defy gravity, so to speak, right? With the power of um, the vocal mechanism and we communicate to other people and we reach them in a way that's deeper than day-to-day -day speech because it requires a lot of dedication and emotion and it becomes something beautiful. So that's sort of my, uh, my two cents on all of this. And um, I'm currently also doing a range extension boot course, boot camp course, and I just uh, completed uh, some some new content on range extension. So hopefully that will uh, shed some light on some of these more complex resonance strategies. It takes a while to explain each sort of aspect of the voice and help guide people through it uh, in a safe and fun way. So um, as always, keep giving me comments, discussion points, challenge the whole framework of things and we'll talk about it and hopefully we can get a better uh, sense of how to move forward and how to grow as as singers and create a community so that's my ultimate goal and thanks again for listening and watching and i will see you guys in a few weeks with my next live stream so take care everybody